July had been blown out like a candle by a biting wind that ushered in a leaden August sky. Considered as a group, my family was not a very prepossessing sight that afternoon, for the weather had brought with it the usual selection of ills to which we were prone. For me, lying on the floor labelling my collection of shells, it had brought Qatar, pouring it into my skull like cement, so that I was forced to breathe stertorously through open mouth. For my brother Leslie, hunched, dark and glowering by the fire, it had inflamed the convolutions of his ears so that they bled delicately but persistently. To my sister Margot, it had delivered a fresh dappling of acne spots, to a face that was already blotched like a red veil. For my mother there was a rich bubbling cold and a twinge of rheumatism to season it. Only my eldest brother Larry was untouched. It was Larry, of course, who started it. He was designed by Providence to go through life like a small blonde firework, exploding ideas in other people's minds, and then curling up with cat-like unctuousness and refusing to take any blame for the consequences. Why do we stand this bloody climate, he asked suddenly. Really, it is time something was done. I can't be expected to produce deathless prose in an atmosphere of gloom and eucalyptus. Yes, dear, said Mother vaguely. What we all need, said Larry, getting into his stride again, is sunshine, a country where we can grow. Yes, dear, that would be nice, agreed Mother, not really listening. I had a letter from George this morning. He says Corfu's wonderful. Why don't we pack up and go to Greece? Mm, very well, dear, if you like, said Mother unguardedly. Where Larry was concerned, she was generally very careful not to commit herself. When, asked Larry rather surprised at this cooperation. Mother, perceiving that she had made a tactical error, cautiously lowered easy recipes from Raj Putana. I can't go just like that, said Mother plaintively. I'll have to arrange something about this house. Arrange, arrange? What, for heaven's sake, just sell it? I can't do that, dear, said Mother, shocked. Why not? But I've only just bought it. Sell it while it's still untarnished, then. Don't be ridiculous, dear said Mother firmly. That's quite out of the question. It would be madness. So we sold the house and fled from the gloom of the English summer like a flock of migrating swallows. We all travelled light, taking with us only what we considered to be the bare essentials of life. When we opened our luggage for customs inspection, the contents of our bags were a fair indication of character and interests. Thus, Margot's luggage contained a multitude of diaphanous garments, three books on slimming, and a regiment of small bottles, each containing some elixir guaranteed to cure acne. Leslie's case held a couple of roll-top pullovers and a pair of trousers which were wrapped round two revolvers, an air pistol, a book called Be Your Own Gunsmith, and a large bottle of oil that leaked. Larry was accompanied by two trunks of books and a briefcase containing his clothes. Mother's luggage was sensibly divided between clothes and various volumes on cooking and gardening. I travelled with only those items that I thought necessary to relieve the tedium of a long journey. Four books on natural history, a butterfly net, a dog, and a jam jar full of caterpillars, all in imminent danger of turning into chrysalids. Thus, by our standards fully equipped, we left the clammy shores of England. France, rain-washed and sorrowful, Switzerland like a Christmas cake, Italy, exuberant, noisy and smelly, were past, leaving only confused memories. The tiny ship throbbed away from the heel of Italy out into the twilight sea, and as we slept in our stuffy cabins, somewhere in that tract of moon-polished water, we passed the invisible dividing line and entered the bright, looking-glass world of Greece. We threaded our way out of the noise and confusion of the custom shed into the brilliant sunshine on the quay. Around us the town rose steeply, tiers of multicoloured houses piled haphazardly, green shutters folded back from their windows like the wings of a thousand moths. Behind us lay the bay, smooth as a plate, smouldering with that unbelievable blue. The next morning we started on our house hunt. Mother had decided that we would hire a car and go out house hunting on our own. She was convinced that somewhere on the island there lurked a villa with a bathroom. 
We did not share Mother's belief, and so it was a slightly irritable and argumentative group that she herded down to the taxi rank in the main square. The taxi drivers, perceiving our innocent appearance, scrambled from inside their cars and flocked round us like vultures, each trying to outshout his compatriots. Their voices grew louder and louder, their eyes flashed, they clutched each other's arms and ground their teeth at one another, and then they laid hold of us as though they would tear us apart. Margot, simpering, stepped into the breach. We English, she yelled at the gesticulating drivers. We no understand Greek. At that moment, everyone was startled into silence by a voice that rumbled out above the uproar. Hoi, roared the voice. Why don't you have someone who can talk your own language? Turning, we saw an ancient dodge parked by the curb. Behind the wheel sat a short, barrel-bodied individual with ham-like hands and a great leathery, scowling face surmounted by a jauntily tilted cap. He opened the door of the car, surged out onto the pavement and waddled across to us. Them's been worrying you, he asked Mother. No, no, said Mother untruthfully. It was just that we had difficulty understanding them. Use one someone who can talk your own language, repeated the new arrival. Them's bastards, if you will excuse the words, would swindle their own mothers. Where's you want to go? He asked, almost truculently. Can you take us to look for a villa? asked Larry. Sure, I'd take us anywhere, just you sis. We are looking, said Mother firmly, for a villa with a bathroom. Do you know of one? Use English? Mm, I thought so. English always wants bathrooms. I get a bathroom in my house. Spiro is my name. Spiro Hakiopoulos. They also calls me Spiro Americano on account of I lives in America. Yes, spent eight years in Chicago. That's where I learned my good English. Went there. I don't make some money, you know. We sped down a white road covered in a thick layer of silky dust that rose in a boiling cloud behind us. A road lined with prickly pears like a fence of green plates, each cleverly balanced on another's edges, and splashed with knobs of scarlet fruit. At last we roared to the top of a hill, and Spiro crammed on his brakes and brought the car to a dust-misted halt. There you are, he said, pointing with a great stubby forefinger. That's the villa with the bathrooms, like you wanted. Spiro was pointing at a gentle curve of hillside that rose from the glittering sea. The hill and the valleys around it were an eiderdown of olive groves that shone with a fish-like gleam where the breeze touched the leaves. Halfway up the slope, guarded by a group of tall, slim cypress trees, nestled a little strawberry-pink villa, like some exotic fruit lying in the greenery. The villa was small and square, standing in its tiny garden with an air of pink-faced determination. As soon as we saw it, we wanted to live there. It was as though the villa had been standing there waiting for our arrival. We felt we had come home. So we were installed in the villa, and we each settled down and adapted ourselves to our surroundings in our respective ways. In between keeping a watchful eye on us all, Mother was settling down in her own way. The house was redolent with the scent of herbs and the sharp tang of garlic and onions, and the kitchen was a full of a bubbling selection of pots, among which she moved, spectacles askew, muttering to herself. For myself, the garden held sufficient interest. I discovered that in the dry leaves under the fuchsia hedge lived a type of spider, a fierce little huntsman with the cunning and ferocity of a tiger. He would stalk about his continent of leaves eyes glistening in the sun, pausing now and then to raise himself up on his hairy legs to peer about. If he saw a fly settled to enjoy a sun bath, he would freeze. Then, as slowly as a leaf growing, he would move forward imperceptibly, edging nearer and nearer, pausing occasionally to fasten his lifeline of silk to the surface of the leaves. Then, when close enough, the huntsman would pause, his legs shift minutely as he got a good purchase, and then he would leap, 
legs spread out in a hairy embrace, straight onto the dreaming fly. Never did I see one of these little spiders miss its kill, once it had manoeuvred into the right positions. All these discoveries filled me with a tremendous delight, so that they had to be shared, and I would burst suddenly into the house and startle the family with the news that the strange, spiky, black caterpillars on the roses were not caterpillars at all, but the young of ladybirds, or with the equally astonishing news that lacewing flies laid eggs on stilts. Gradually, the magic of the island settled over us as gently and clinging as pollen. Each day had a tranquillity, a timelessness about it, so that you wished it would never end. But then the dark skin of night would peel off, and there would be a fresh day waiting for us, glossy and colourful as a child's transfer, and with the same tinge of unreality. Scarcely had we settled into the strawberry-pink villa before Mother decided that I was running wild, and that it was necessary for me to have some sort of education. But where to find this on a remote Greek island? As usual, when a problem arose, the entire family flung itself with enthusiasm into the task of solving it. Each member had his or her own idea of what was best for me, and each argued with such fervour that any discussion about my future generally resulted in an uproar. Well, if you insist on stuffing him full of useless information, I suppose George would have a shot at teaching him, said Larry. That's a brainwave, said Mother delightedly. Will you go over and see him? I think the sooner he starts, the better. I discovered that George was an old friend of Larry's who'd come to Corfu to write. There was nothing very unusual about this, for all Larry's acquaintances in those days were either authors, poets or painters. Gravely, George set about the task of teaching me. He was undeterred by the fact that there were no school books available on the island. He simply ransacked his own library and appeared on the appointed day armed with a most unorthodox selection of tomes. Let me see, let me see, he would murmur, running a long forefinger down our carefully prepared timetable. Mm, yes, yes, mathematics. Now, if I remember rightly, we were involved in the Herculean task of discovering how long it would take six men to build a wall if three of them took a week. Mm, yes, I seem to recall that we've spent almost as much time on this problem as the men spent on the wall. Ah, well, let us gird our loins and do battle once again. Our attempts at history were not at first conspicuously successful until George discovered that by seasoning a series of unpalatable facts with a sprig of zoology and a sprinkle of completely irrelevant detail, he could get me interested. Thus I became conversant with some historical data which, to the best of my knowledge, have never been recorded before. Breathlessly, history lesson by history lesson, I followed Hannibal's progress over the Alps. His reason for attempting such a feat and what he intended to do on the other side were details that scarcely worried me. Later, George wisely instituted the novel system of outdoor lessons. Some mornings he arrived carrying a large furry towel, and together we would make our way down through the olive groves and along the road that was like a carpet of white velvet under its layer of dust. Then we branched off to a goat track, that ran along the top of miniature cliffs until it led us to a bay, secluded and small, with a crescent-shaped fringe of white sand running round it. The sea was like a warm, silky coverlet that moved my body gently to and fro. There were no waves, only this gentle underwater movement, the pulse of the sea rocking me softly. Around my legs, the coloured fish flicked and trembled, and stood on their heads while they mumbled at me with toothless gums. In the drooping clusters of olives, a cicada whispered gently to itself. And so they carried Nelson down below as quickly as possible, so that none of the crew would know he had been hit. He was mortally wounded, and lying below decks with the battle still raging above, he murmured his last words, Kiss me, Hardy, and then he died. What? Ah, uh, yes, well, he'd already told Hardy that if anything happened to him, he could have his bird's eggs. 
So, though England had lost her finest seamen, the battle had been won, and it had far-reaching effects in Europe. Across the mouth of the bay, a sun-bleached boat would pass, rowed by a brown fisherman in tattered trousers, standing in the stern and twisting an oar in the water like a fish's tail. He would raise one hand in lazy salute, and across the still blue water, you could hear the plaintive squeak of the oar as it twisted, and the soft clop as it dug into the sea. One hot, dreamy afternoon, when everything except the shouting cicadas seemed to be asleep, my dog Roger and I set out to see how far we could climb over the hills before dark. We made our way up through the olive groves, striped and dappled with white sunlight, where the air was hot and still, and eventually we clambered above the trees and sat down for a rest. A tiny green grasshopper with a long melancholy face sat twitching his hind legs nervously. A plump scarlet mite, the size of a matchhead, struggled like a tubby huntsman through the forest of moss. It was a microscopic world, full of fascinating life. As I watched the mite making his slow progress, I noticed a curious thing. Here and there, on the green plush surface of the moss, were scattered faint circular marks, each the size of a shilling. I prodded the edge of one of these circles with a piece of grass. It remained unmoved. I began to think the mark was caused by some curious way in which the moss grew. I probed again more vigorously, and suddenly my stomach gave a clutch of tremendous excitement. It was as though my grass stalk had found a hidden spring, for the whole circle lifted up like a trap door. As I stared, I saw to my amazement that it was, in fact, a trap door. The edge of the door was fastened to the lip of a tunnel by a small flap of silk that acted as a hinge. I gazed at this magnificent piece of workmanship and wondered what on earth could have made it. Peering down the silken tunnel, I could see nothing. I poked my grass stalk down, but there was no response. For a long time I sat staring at this fantastic home, trying to decide what sort of a beast had made it. I felt that I must get down to the bottom of this problem immediately. I would go down and ask George if he knew what this mysterious beast was. I arrived at George's villa out of breath, bursting with suppressed excitement, gave a perfunctory knock at the door, and I dashed in. Only then did I realise that he had company. Seated in a chair near him was a figure which at first glance I decided must be George's brother, for he also wore a beard. He was, however, in contrast to George, immaculately dressed, in a grey flannel suit with waistcoat, a spotless white shirt, a tasteful but sombre tie, and large, solid, highly polished boots. Good evening, George greeted me. From the joyful speed of your entry, I take it that you have not come for a little extra tuition. I apologised for the intrusion, and then told George about the curious nests I'd found. Ah, thank heavens you're here, Theodore, he said to his bearded companion. I shall now be able to hand the problem over to expert hands. Hardly an expert, mumbled the man called Theodore, deprecatingly. Jerry, this is Dr. Theodore Stephanides, said George. He's an expert on practically everything you care to mention, and what you don't mention, he does. He, like you, is an eccentric nature lover. Theodore, this is Jerry Darrell. Very pleased to meet you, said the bearded man, and gave a quick, shy glance from twinkling blue eyes. I shook his hand and said I was very pleased to meet him too. Then we stood in awkward silence while George watched us, grinning. Well, Theodore, he said at last, and what do you think produced these strange, secret passages? Theodore clasped his hands behind his back, lifted himself onto his toes several times, his boots squeaking protestingly, and gravely considered the floor. Well, uh, he said, his words coming slowly and meticulously, mm, it sounds to me as though they might be the burrows of the trapdoor spider. It is a species which is quite common here in Corfu. That is to say, when I say common, I suppose I have found some 30 or uh, 40 specimens during the time I have been here. Ah, said George, trapdoor spiders, eh? Yes, said Theodore. 
I feel that it is more than probable that that is what they are. However, I may be mistaken. He rose and fell on his toes, squeaking gently, and then he shot me a keen glance. Perhaps if they are not too far away, we could go and verify it, he suggested tentatively. I mean to say, if you have nothing better to do and uh, it's not too far... His voice trailed away on a faintly interrogative note. I said that they were only just up the hill, not really far. Hmm, said Theodore. Thank you for a delightful tea. And stumped gravely off along the path by my side. As we walked along, I studied him covertly. He had a straight, well-shaped nose, a humorous mouth lurking in the ash-blonde beard, straight, rather bushy eyebrows under which his eyes, keen but with a twinkle in them and laughter wrinkles at the corner, surveyed the world. He strode along energetically, humming to himself. At length we came to the gloomy olive grove and I led Theodore to the bank and pointed out the mysterious trapdoor. He peered down at it, his eyes narrowed. Ah, uh ah, -huh, he said. Yes, mm hmm. Mm, yes. He produced from his pocket a tiny penknife, opened it, inserted the point of the blade delicately under the little door and flipped it back. He peered down the tunnel, blew down it, and then let the trapdoor fall back into place again. Yes, they are the burrows of the trapdoor spiders, he said, but this one does not appear to be inhabited. Generally, the creature will hold on to the... Um, trap door with her legs or rather her claws and she holds on with such tenacity that you have to be careful or you will damage the door trying to force it open mm. yes yes look these these are the burrows of the females of course the male makes a similar burrow but it is only about half the size I remarked that it was the most curious structure I had seen ha 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 yes Yes, said Theodore. <laughs> they are certainly very curious. We walked down the hill in silence. When we reached the place where the paths forked, I said that I must leave him. Ah, well, uh, I'll, um, I'll say goodbye, he said, staring at his boots. I have enjoyed meeting you. We stood in silence for a moment. Theodore was afflicted with the acute embarrassment that always seemed to overwhelm him when greeting or saying goodbye to someone. He stared hard at his boots for a moment longer, and then he held out his hand and he shook mine gravely. <laughs> goodbye, he said. I, um, well, I, I expect we shall meet again. I made my way back home through the darkening fields to tell the family of my new discovery and of my meeting with Theodore. I hoped to see him again, for there were many things I wanted to ask him, but I felt it would be unlikely that he would have very much time to spare for me. I was mistaken, however, for two days later Leslie came back from an excursion into the town and handed me a small parcel. Met that bearded Johnny, he said laconically. You know, that scientist bloke said this was for you. Incredulously, I stared at the parcel. I turned it over, and there, written on it in neat, spidery writing, was my name. I tore off the paper as quickly as I could. Inside was a small box and a letter. My dear Jerry Durrell, I wondered after our conversation the other day if it might not assist your investigations of the local natural history to have some form of magnifying instrument. I am therefore sending you this pocket microscope in the hope it will be of some use to you. It is, of course, not of very high magnification, but you will find it sufficient for field work. With best wishes, yours sincerely, Theo Stephanides. P.S. If you have nothing better to do on Thursday, perhaps you would care to come to tea, and I could then show you some of my microscope slides. During the last days of the dying summer, and throughout the warm, wet winter that followed, Tea with Theodore became a weekly affair. Every Thursday I would set out my pockets bulging with matchboxes and test tubes full of specimens to be driven into the town by Spiro. It was an appointment that I would not have missed for anything.
As soon as we had settled down and started to enjoy the island, Larry, with characteristic generosity, wrote to all his friends and asked them to come out and stay. The fact that the villa was only just big enough to house the family apparently had not occurred to him. Oh, I've asked a few people out for a week or so, he said casually to Mother one morning. Well, that'll be nice, dear, said Mother unthinkingly. You'd better let the Pension Suisse know when they're coming. Well, what for? asked Larry, surprised. So that they can reserve the rooms, said Mother, equally surprised. No, but I've invited them to stay here, Larry pointed out. Oh, Larry, you haven't. Really, you are most thoughtless. How can they possibly stay here? I really don't see what you're making a fuss about, said Larry coldly. But where are they going to sleep, said Mother, distraught. There's hardly enough room for us as it is. Nonsense, Mother, there is plenty of room if the place is organised properly. If Margot and Les sleep out on the veranda, that gives you two rooms. You and Jerry could move into the drawing room and that would leave those rooms free. Oh, don't be silly, dear. We can't all camp out all over the place like gypsies. Besides, it's still chilly at night. And I don't think Margot and Les ought to sleep outside. There simply isn't room to entertain in this villa. You'll just have to write to these people and put them off. I can't put them off, said Larry. They're on their way. Oh, really, Larry, you are the most annoying creature. I think at least you might be able to tell me how many you've invited, said Mother. Yes, well, I can't really remember now. Some of them didn't reply, but that doesn't mean anything. Anyway, he continued, if you budget for seven or eight people, I should think that would cover it. You mean including ourselves? No, no, I mean seven or eight people as well as the family. But it's absurd, Larry. We can't possibly fit 13 people into this villa with all the goodwill in the world. Well, let's move, then. Since this villa isn't big enough, let's go and get one that is. Now, don't be ridiculous, dear. Even if we did move into a villa large enough to house 13 people, what are we going to do with the extra space when they've gone? Well, invite some more people, said Larry, astonished that Mother shouldn't have thought of this simple answer for herself. Mother glared at him, her spectacles askew. We are not moving to another villa, she said firmly. I have made up my mind about that. She straightened her spectacles, gave Larry a defiant glare, and strutted off towards the kitchen, registering determination in every inch. The new villa was enormous, a tall square Venetian mansion, with faded daffodil yellow walls, green shutters, and a fox red roof. It stood on a hill overlooking the sea, surrounded by unkempt olive groves and silent orchards of lemon and orange trees. The whole place had an atmosphere of ancient melancholy about it. The crumbling wall that surrounded the sunken garden alongside the house was a rich hunting ground for me. It was an ancient brick wall that had been plastered over, but now this outer skin was green with moss, bulging and sagging with the damp of many winters. The inhabitants of the wall were a mixed lot, but the shyest and most self-effacing of the wall community were the most dangerous. Slide a knife blade carefully under a piece of the loose plaster and lever it gently away from the brick. And there, crouching beneath it, would be a little black scorpion, an inch long, looking as though he were made out of polished chocolate. One day I found a fat female scorpion in the wall, wearing what at first glance appeared to be a pale fawn fur coat. Closer inspection proved that this strange garment was made up of a mass of tiny babies clinging to the mother's back. I was enraptured by this family, and I made up my mind to smuggle them into the house and up to my bedroom so that I might keep them and watch them grow up. With infinite care, I manoeuvred the mother and family into a matchbox and then hurried to the villa. It was rather unfortunate that just as I entered the door, lunch should be served. However, I placed the matchbox carefully on the mantelpiece in the drawing room so that the scorpions should get plenty of air and made my way to the dining room and joined the family for the meal. Dawdling over my food, feeding Roger surreptitiously under the table and listening to the family arguing... I completely forgot about my exciting new captures. At last, Larry, having finished,
fetched the cigarettes from the drawing room and lying back in his chair, he put one in his mouth and picked up the matchbox he had brought. Oblivious of my impending doom, I watched him interestedly as, still talking glibly, he opened the matchbox. Now, I maintain to this day that the female scorpion meant no harm. She was agitated and a trifle annoyed at being shut up in a matchbox for so long, and so she seized the first opportunity to escape. She hoisted herself out of the box with great rapidity, her babies clinging on desperately, and scuttled onto the back of Larry's hand. He uttered a roar of fright that made Lugaretzia, our maid, drop a plate, and brought Roger out from beneath the table, barking wildly. With a flick of his hand, he sent the unfortunate scorpion flying down the table, and she landed midway between Margot and Leslie, scattering babies like confetti as she thumped onto the cloth. Thoroughly enraged at this treatment, the creature sped towards Leslie, her sting quivering with emotion. Leslie leapt to his feet, overturning his chair, and flicked out desperately with his napkin, sending the scorpion rolling across the cloth towards Margot, who promptly let out a scream that any railway engine would have been proud to produce. Mother, completely bewildered by this sudden and rapid change from peace to chaos, put on her glasses and peered down the table to see what was causing the pandemonium. And at that moment, Margot, in a vain attempt to stop the scorpion's advance, hurled a glass of water at it. The shower missed the animal completely, but successfully drenched Mother, who, not being able to stand cold water, promptly lost her breath and sat gasping at the end of the table, unable even to protest. The scorpion had now gone to ground under Leslie's plate, while her babies swarmed wildly all over the table. Roger, mystified by the panic but determined to do his share, ran round and round the room, barking hysterically. "'It's that bloody boy again!' bellowed Larry. "'Look out, look out, they're coming!' screamed Margot. "'All we need is a book!' roared Leslie. "'Don't panic! Hit em with a book!' "'It's that bloody boy! He'll kill a lot of us! Look at the table! It's knee-deep in scorpions!' Since no one had bothered to explain things to him, Roger was under the mistaken impression that the family was being attacked and that it was his duty to defend them. As Lugaretzia was the only stranger in the room, he came to the logical conclusion that she must be the responsible party. So he bit her on the ankle. This didn't help matters very much. By the time a certain amount of order had been restored, all the baby scorpions had hidden themselves under various plates and bits of cutlery. Eventually, after impassioned pleas on my part, backed up by Mother, Leslie's suggestion that the whole lot be slaughtered was quashed. While the family, still simmering with rage and fright, retired to the drawing room, I spent half an hour rounding up the babies, picking them up in a teaspoon and returning them to their mother's back. Then I carried them outside on a saucer and, with the utmost reluctance, released them on the garden wall. From my point of view, the worst repercussion of the whole affair was that Mother decided I was running wild again and that it was high time I received a little more education. While the problem of finding a full-time tutor was being solved, she was determined that my French, at least, should be kept in trim. So arrangements were made, and every morning Spiro would drive me into the town for my French lesson with the Belgian consul. In some ways, these French lessons were good for me, I didn't learn any French, it's true, but by the end of the morning I was so bored that my afternoon sorties into the surrounding country were made with double the normal enthusiasm. Then, with the summer, came Peter to tutor me. A tall, handsome young man, fresh from Oxford, with decided ideas on education, which I found rather trying to begin with. But gradually the atmosphere of the island worked its way insidiously under his skin. He discovered that the intricacies of geological strata and the effects of warm currents could be explained much more easily while swimming along the coast, while the simplest way of teaching me English was to allow me to write something each day which he would correct. I modelled my style on the boy's own paper, and while I was at work on my masterpiece, breathing heavily, tongue protruding, breaking off for discussions with Roger on the finer points of the plot, Peter and Margot took a stroll in the sunken garden to look at the flowers. To my surprise, they had both suddenly become very botanically minded, and as the summer days grew longer, 
Margot's interest in gardening seemed to become more sustained. In the summer, when the moon was full, the family took to bathing at night, for during the day the sun was so fierce that the sea became too hot to be refreshing. As soon as the moon had risen, we would drift down the coast for half a mile or so to where there was a small bay with a lip of white sand, anchor our boat, the sea cow, in deep water, and then dive over the side to gamble and plunge and set the moonlight shaking across the waters of the bay. When tired, we swam languidly to the shore and lay on the warm rocks, gazing up into the star-freckled sky. Generally, after half an hour or so, I would get bored with the conversation and slip back into the water and swim slowly out across the bay to lie on my back, cushioned by the warm sea, gazing up at the moon. One night, while I was thus occupied, I discovered that our bay was used by other creatures as well. Drifting there, relaxed and dreamy, I was suddenly startled to hear quite close to me a clop and gurgle of water, followed by a long, deep sigh, and a series of gentle ripples rocked me up and down. Hastily I righted myself and trod water, looking to see how far from the beach I'd drifted. To my alarm, I found that not only was I some considerable distance from the shore, but from the sea cow as well and I was not at all sure what sort of creature it was swimming around in the dark waters beneath me. I was feeling more and more uncomfortable, and I was just about to call for assistance, when some twenty feet away from me, the sea seemed to part with a gentle swish and gurgle, a gleaming back appeared, gave a deep, satisfied sigh, and sank below the surface again. I had hardly time to recognise it as a porpoise, before I found I was right in the midst of them. They rose all round me, sighing luxuriously, their black backs shining in the moonlight. There must have been about eight of them, and one rose so close that I could have swum forward three strokes and touched his ebony head. Heaving and sighing heavily, they played across the bay, and I swam with them, watching fascinated as they rose to the surface, crumpling the water, breathed deeply, and then dived beneath the surface again, leaving only an expanding hoop of foam to mark the spot. Presently, as if obeying a signal, they turned and headed out of the bay towards the distant coast of Albania, and I trod water and watched them go, swimming up the white chain of moonlight, backs agleam as they rose and plunged with heavy ecstasy in the water as warm as fresh milk. For some time... Mother had greatly envied us our swimming, both in the daytime and at night, but as she pointed out when we suggested she join us, she was far too old for that sort of thing. Eventually, however, under constant pressure from us, Mother paid a visit into town and returned to the villa, coyly bearing a mysterious parcel. Opening this, she astonished us all by holding up an extraordinary shapeless garment of black cloth covered from top to bottom with hundreds of frills and pleats and tucks. Well, what do you think of it? asked Mother. We stared at the odd garment and wondered what it was for. Well, what is it? asked Larry at length. It's a bathing costume, of course, said Mother. What on earth do you think it was? Well, it looked to me like a badly skinned whale, said Larry, peering at it closely. You can't possibly wear that, said Margot, horrified. Why, it looks as though it was made in 1920. You really are hopeless, Mother. But I like it, and I'm not asking you to wear it, Mother pointed out belligerently. That's right. You do what you want to do, agreed Larry. Don't be put off. It'll probably suit you very well if you can grow another three or four legs to go with it. In order to celebrate her first entry into the sea, we decided to have a moonlight picnic down at the bay and sent an invitation to Theodore, who was the only stranger that Mother would tolerate on such an occasion. Food and wine were prepared, the boat was cleaned out and filled with cushions, and eventually we reached the bay, and the great moment had arrived. Amid much cheering, Mother removed her housecoat, 
and stood revealed in all her glory, clad in the bathing costume, which made her look, as Larry pointed out, like a sort of marine Albert memorial. Roger behaved very well, until he saw Mother wade into the shallow water in a slow and dignified manner. He then got terribly excited. He seemed to be under the impression that the bathing costume was some sort of sea monster that had enveloped Mother and was now about to carry her out to sea. Barking wildly, he flung himself to the rescue, grabbed one of the frills dangling so plentifully round the edge of the costume and tugged with all his strength in order to pull Mother back to safety. Mother, who had just remarked that she thought the water a little cold, lost her footing and sat down heavily in two feet of water, while Roger tugged so hard that a large section of the frill gave way. We writhed on the sand, helpless with laughter, while Mother sat gasping in the shallows, making desperate attempts to regain her feet, beat Roger off, and retain at least a portion of her costume. In the end, it was Theodore who shooed Roger away and helped Mother to her feet. Eventually, after we had partaken of a glass of wine to celebrate and recover from what Larry referred to as Perseus's rescue of Andromeda, we went in to swim, and Mother sat discreetly in the shallows while Roger crouched nearby, growling ominously at the costume as it bulged and fluttered round Mother's waist. The phosphorescence was particularly good that night. By plunging your hand into the water and dragging it along, you could draw a wide, golden-green ribbon of cold fire across the sea. And when you dived, as you hit the surface, it seemed as though you had plunged into a frosty furnace of glinting light. When we were tired, we waded out of the sea, the water running off our bodies so that we seemed to be on fire, and lay on the sand to eat. Then, as the wine was opened at the end of the meal, as if by arrangement, a few fireflies appeared in the olives behind us, a sort of overture to the show. First of all, there were just two or three green specks, sliding smoothly through the trees, winking regularly. But gradually more and more appeared, until parts of the olive grove were lit with a weird glow. Never had we seen so many fireflies congregated in one spot. They flicked through the trees in swarms. They crawled on the grass, the bushes and the olive trunks. They drifted in swarms over our heads and landed on the rugs, like green embers. Glittering streams of them flew out over the bay, swirling over the water, and then, right on cue, the porpoises appeared, swimming in line into the bay, rocking rhythmically through the water, their backs as if painted with phosphorus. In the centre of the bay they swam round, diving and rolling, occasionally leaping high in the air and falling back into a conflagration of light. With the fireflies above and the illuminated porpoises below, it was a fantastic sight. We could even see the luminous trails beneath the surface where the porpoises swam in fiery patterns across the sandy bottom. And when they leapt high in the air... The drops of emerald glowing water flicked from them and you couldn't tell if it was phosphorescence or fireflies that you were looking at. For an hour or so we watched this pageant and then slowly the fireflies drifted back inland and farther down the coast. Then the porpoises lined up and sped out to sea leaving a flaming path behind them that flickered and glowed and then died slowly like a glowing branch laid across the bay. As the summer grew hotter and hotter, we decided that it required too much effort to row the sea cow down the coast to our bathing bay, so we invested in an outboard engine. The acquisition of this machine opened up a vast area of coastland for us, and it was thus that I became aware of the fact that stretching along the coast for miles was a scattered archipelago of small islands, some fairly extensive, some that were really outsized rocks with a wig of greenery perched precariously on top. For some reason which I could not discover, the sea fauna were greatly attracted by this archipelago, and round the edges of the islands, in rock pools and sandy bays the size of a large table, there was a bewildering assortment of life. 
I managed to inveigle the family into several trips to these islets. But as these had few good bathing spots, the family soon got bored with having to sit on sun-baked rocks while I fished interminably in the pools and unearthed at intervals strange and to them revolting sea creatures. Our trips there became less and less frequent, in spite of all arguments on my part, and I was tortured by the thought of all the wonderful animal life waiting in the limpid pools to be caught. But I was unable to do anything about it, simply because I had no boat of my own. But then, just when I'd almost given up hope, I was struck by a brilliant idea. My birthday was due fairly soon, and if I dealt with my family skilfully, I felt sure I could not only get a boat, but a lot of other equipment as well. I therefore suggested to the family that instead of letting them choose my birthday presents, I might tell them the things which I wanted most. I mean, in this way, they could be sure of not disappointing me. I decided to tackle Leslie verbally instead of handing him a list, but I knew I should have to choose my moment with care. I had to wait some days for what I considered to be a propitious moment. Then I casually asked him what he would like to give me for my birthday. Mm, I hadn't thought about it, he replied absently. Oh, I don't mind. Anything you like to choose? I said I wanted a boat. Leslie, realising how he'd been trapped, said indignantly that a boat was far too large a present for a birthday, and anyway he couldn't afford it. I said I'd thought, since he knew so much about boats, he'd be able to build me one. However, if he thought that'd be too difficult, well... Oh, all right, all right, said Leslie, exasperatedly. I'll build you a boat. But I'm not having you hanging around while I do it, understand? You're to keep well away. You are not to see it until it's finished. Delightedly, I agreed to these conditions, and so for the next two weeks, Spiro kept turning up with carloads of planks, and the sounds of sawing, hammering, and blasphemy floated round from the back veranda. The day before my birthday, the entire family made an expedition into the town. The reasons were threefold. Firstly, they wanted to purchase my presents. Secondly, the larder had to be stocked up. The third reason for going to town was to make sure that Lugarezia attended the dentist. Recently, her teeth had been her chief woe, and Dr. Andrucelli, having peered into her mouth, had uttered a series of popping noises indicative of horror and said that she must have all her teeth out, since it was obvious that they were the cause of all her ailments. After a week's arguing, accompanied by floods of tears, we managed to get Lugarezia to consent, but she had refused to go without moral support. So bearing her white and weeping in our midst, we swept into town. The following morning was full of incident. Lugarezia had recovered sufficiently to undertake light duties, and she followed us all round the house, displaying with pride the gory cavities in her gums, and describing in detail the agonies she had suffered with each individual tooth. My presence having been duly inspected and the family thanked, I then went round to the back veranda with Leslie, and there lay a mysterious shape. Leslie drew the tarpaulin covering the shape aside with the air of a conjurer, and there lay my boat. She was some seven feet long and almost circular in shape. Leslie explained hurriedly, in case I thought the shape was due to defective craftsmanship, that the reason for this was that the planks had been too short for the frame, an explanation I found perfectly satisfactory. After all, it was the sort of irritating thing that could have happened to anyone. I said stoutly that I thought it was a lovely shape for a boat, and indeed I thought it was. She reminded me of an earnest dung beetle, an insect for which I had great affection. Enthusiastically, I suggested launching her at once. Leslie, who was a stickler for procedure, said you couldn't launch a ship without naming her, and had I thought of a name yet. I was just about to suggest the bum trinket, said Larry. Oh, Larry, dear, Mother reproved. Don't teach the boy things like that. I turned Larry's suggestion over in my mind. It was certainly an unusual name, but then so was my choice. Bootle. They both seemed to conjure up the shape and personality of the boat. After much thought, 
I decided what to do. A pot of black paint was produced, and laboriously, in rather trickly capitals, I traced her name along the side. The Bootle Bum Trinket. There it was. Not only an unusual name, but an aristocratically hyphenated one as well. In order to ease Mother's mind, I had to promise that I would only refer to the boat as the Bootle in conversation with strangers. Then we cast the Bootle bum trinket off the jetty with a mighty heave, and she landed on her flat bottom with a report like a cannon showering seawater in all directions, and then bobbed steadily and confidently on the ripples. Now, said Leslie, organising things, let's get the mast in. Margot, you hold a nose, that's it. Now, uh, Peter, if you're... Uh, get into the stern. Larry and I'll hand you the mast. All you've got to do is stick it in that socket. So, while Margot lay on her tummy, holding the nose of the boat, Peter leapt nimbly into the stern and settled himself with legs apart to receive the mast, which Larry and Leslie were holding. Mm, this mast looks a bit long to me, Les, said Larry, eyeing it critically. Oh, nonsense, it'll be fine when it's in, retorted Leslie. Now, you ready, Peter? Peter nodded, braced himself, clasped the mast firmly in both hands and plunged it into the socket. Then he stood back, dusted his hands and the bootle bum trinket, with a speed remarkable for a craft of her circumference, turned turtle. Peter, clad in his one decent suit which he'd put on in honour of my birthday, disappeared with scarcely a splash. Oh, he'll drown, he'll drown, screamed Margot, who always tended to look at the dark side in a crisis. Oh, nonsense, it's not deep enough, said Leslie. I told you that mast was too long, said Larry unctuously. Thank God he's come up, said Margot in fervent tones as the bedraggled and spluttering Peter rose to the surface. We hauled him out and Margot hurried him up to the house to try and get his suit dry before the party. Spiro arrived soon after lunch bringing with him a tall, elderly man who had the air of an ambassador. This, Spiro explained, was the King of Greece's ex-butler, who had been prevailed upon to come out of retirement and help with the party. Spiro then turned everyone out of the kitchen, and he and the butler closeted themselves in there together. The first guest to arrive was Theodore, sitting spick and span in a carriage, his best suit on, his boots polished, and as a concession to the occasion, without any collecting gear. He clasped in one hand a walking stick, and in the other a neatly tied parcel. Ah, uh, aha, uh, uh, many uh, happy returns of the day, he said, shaking my hand. I have brought you a small present to commemorate the occasion. On opening the parcel, I was delighted to find that it contained a fat volume entitled Life in Ponds and Streams. More and more guests arrived, and with them came presents. Most of these were, from my point of view, useless, as they couldn't be adapted for natural history work. The best of the presents were, in my opinion, two puppies, brought by a peasant family I knew who lived not far away. One puppy was liver and white, with large ginger eyebrows, and the other was coal black with large ginger eyebrows. As they were presents, the family had, of course, to accept them. Roger viewed them with suspicion and interest. So in order that they should all get acquainted, I locked them in the dining room with a large plate of party delicacies between them. The results were not quite what I'd anticipated, for when the flood of guests grew so large that we had to slide back the doors and let some of them into the dining room, we found Roger seated gloomily on the floor, the two puppies gambling round him, while the room was decorated in a fashion that left us in no doubt that the new additions had both eaten and drunk to their heart's content. Larry's suggestion that they be called Whiddle and Puke was greeted with disgust by my mother, but the name stuck, and Whittle and Puke they remained. Still the guests came, overflowing the drawing room into the dining room and out of the French windows onto the veranda. Some of them had come thinking that they would be bored, and after an hour or so they enjoyed themselves so much that they called their carriages, went home, 
and reappeared with the rest of their families. The wine flowed, the air was blue with cigarette smoke, and the geckos were too frightened to come out of the cracks in the ceiling because of the noise and laughter. Later, as I lay in bed, with Roger across my feet and the puppy on each side of me, I gazed through the window at the sky, watching the pink spread across the olive top, extinguishing the stars one by one, and thought that, taken all round, it had been an extremely good birthday party. On the day he came out to help me build the magpies their new home, I asked to be shown a few of the more simple tricks. Mm, well, said Krafelski, licking his lips, I suppose I can show you a few of the more elementary holes, but it takes a long time to become a proficient wrestler, you know. Delighted, I asked him if we should wrestle out on the veranda, where the family could watch us, or in the seclusion of the drawing room. Krafelski decided on the drawing room. It was important not to be distracted, he said. So we went into the house and moved the furniture out of the way, and Krafelski reluctantly took off his coat. He explained that the basic and most important principle of wrestling was to try to throw your opponent off balance. You could do this by seizing him round the waist and giving a quick sideways twitch. He demonstrated what he meant, catching me and throwing me gently onto the sofa. Now, he said, holding up a finger, have you got the idea? I said, yes, I thought I'd got the idea all right. That's the ticket, said Krafalski. Now you throw me. Determined to be a credit to my instructor, I threw him with great enthusiasm. I hurled myself across the room, seized him round the chest, squeezed as hard as I could to prevent his escape, and then flung him with a dexterous twist of my wrist towards the nearest chair. Unfortunately, I, I didn't throw him hard enough, and he missed the chair altogether and crashed onto the floor, uttering a yell that brought the family rushing in from the veranda. We lifted the white-faced, groaning wrestling champion onto the couch, and Margot went to bring some brandy. What on earth did you do to him? asked Mother. Well, I, I said that all I'd done was to follow instructions. I'd, I mean, I'd been invited to throw him, and I'd thrown him. It's perfectly simple. I didn't see that any blame could be attached to me. You don't know your own strength, dear, said Mother. You should be more careful. Damn silly thing to do, said Leslie. Might have killed him. I knew a man once who was crippled for life by a wrestling throw, remarked Larry conversationally. Krafelski raised himself into a sitting position and gave a wan smile. I think perhaps if you'd be kind enough to let Spiro drive me, it'd be wise if I went into town and consulted a doctor. Yes, of course Spiro will take you, said Mother. I should go along to Theodore's laboratory and get him to take an X-ray just to put your mind at rest. So we wrapped Krafelski, pale but composed, in quantities of rugs and placed him tenderly in the back of the car. Tell Theodore to send us a note with Spiro to let us know how you are, said Mother. I, I do hope you'll soon be better. I'm really so sorry this had to happen. It was so very careless of Jerry. This was Krafelski's big moment. He smiled a smile of pain-racked nonchalance and waved a hand feebly. No, please, please don't distress yourself. Think nothing more about it, he said. Don't blame the boy. It wasn't his fault. You see, I am a little out of practice. Much later that evening, Spiro returned from his errand of mercy, bearing a note from Theodore. Dear Mrs. Durrell, it appears from the X-ray photographs I have taken of Mr. Krafelski's chest that he has cracked two ribs. One of them, I am sorry to say, quite severely. He was reticent as to the cause of the damage, but quite considerable force must have been employed. However, if he keeps them bound up for a week or so, he should suffer no permanent injury. With kindest regards to you all, yours, Theodore. P.S. I didn't, by any chance, leave a small black box at your house when I came out last Thursday, did I? It contains some very interesting Anopheles mosquitoes I had obtained, and it seems I must have mislaid it. Perhaps you would let me know. Below the villa, 
between the line of hills on which it stood and the sea were the chessboard fields. The sea curved into the coast in a great, almost landlocked bay, shallow and bright, and on the flat land along its edges lay the intricate pattern of narrow waterways that had once been salt pans in the Venetian days. Each neat little patch of earth framed with canals was richly cultivated and green with crops of maize, potatoes, figs and grapes. These fields, small coloured squares edged with shining waters, lay like a sprawling multicoloured chessboard on which the peasants' coloured figures moved from place to place. It was easy to get lost there, for if you were enthusiastically chasing a butterfly and crossed the wrong little wooden bridge from one island to the next, you could find yourself wandering to and fro, trying to get your bearings in a bewildering maze of fig trees, reeds and curtains of tall maize. Most of the fields belonged to friends of mine, peasant families who lived up in the hills, and so when I was walking there I was always sure of being able to rest and gossip over a bunch of grapes with some acquaintance or to receive interesting items of news, such as the fact that there was a lark's nest under the melon plants on Giorgio's land. If you walked straight across the chessboard, without being distracted by friends, sidetracked by terrapins sliding down the mud banks and plopping into the water, or the sudden crackling buzz of a dragonfly swooping past, you eventually came to the spot where all the channels widened and vanished into a great, flat acreage of sand, moulded into endless neat pleats by the previous night's tides. Here long winding chains of flotsam marked the sea's slow retreat. One afternoon, having nothing better to do, I decided to take the dogs and visit the fields. I would make yet another attempt to catch old Plop, a large and ancient terrapin that lived in one of the canals. We followed the edge of the canal towards the place where old Plop had his favourite mudslide, and as we were drawing near to this spot, I was just about to caution the dogs on the need for absolute silence, when a large green lizard flashed out of a corn patch and scuttled away. The dogs, barking wildly, galloped in eager pursuit. Their yelping in the distance died away. There was a pause, and then they started to bark in a chorus. Monotonous, evenly spaced barks that meant that they'd found something. Wondering what it could be, I hurried after them. At first, I couldn't see what it was they were so excited over. Then, what I had taken to be a rootlet moved, and I was looking at a pair of fat brown water snakes coiled passionately together in the grass, regarding me with impersonal silvery eyes from their spade-shaped heads. This was a thrilling find. Slowly, I manoeuvred my butterfly net round until I could unscrew the handle. Having done this, I had a stick with which to do the catching, but the problem was how to catch two snakes with one stick. While I was working this out, one of them decided the thing for me, uncoiling himself unhurriedly and sliding into the water as cleanly as a knife blade. Thinking that I'd lost him, I watched irritably as his undulating length merged with the water reflection. Then, to my delight, I saw a column of mud rise slowly through the water and expand like a rose on the surface. The reptile had buried himself at the bottom, and I knew he would stay there until he thought I'd gone. I turned my attention to his mate, pressing her down in the lush grass with the stick. She twisted herself into a complicated knot and, opening her pink mouth, hissed at me. I grabbed her firmly round the neck between finger and thumb and she hung limp in my hand while I stroked her handsome white belly and the brown back where the scales were raised slightly like the surface of a fir cone. I put her tenderly into the basket and then prepared to capture the other one. I took off my sandals and lured myself into the warm water, feeling the liquid mud squeeze between my toes and stroke up my legs, as soft as ashes. Suddenly, under my foot, I felt the slithering body 
and I plunged my arms elbow deep into the water and grabbed. My fingers closed only on mud, which oozed between them and drifted away in turbulent slow-motion clouds. I was just cursing my ill luck when the snake shot to the surface a yard away from me and started to swim sinuously along the surface. With a yell of triumph, I flung myself full length on top of him. There was a confused moment as I sank beneath the dark waters and the silt boiled up into my eyes, ears and mouth, but I could feel the reptile's body thrashing wildly to and fro, clasped in my left hand, and I glowed with triumph. Gasping and spluttering under my layer of mud, I sat up in the canal and grabbed the snake round the neck before he could recover his wits and bite me. Then I spat for a long time to rid my teeth and lips of the fine, gritty layer which coated them. When I at last rose to my feet and turned to wade ashore, I found, to my surprise, that my audience of dogs had been enlarged by the silent arrival of a man who was squatting comfortably on his haunches and watching me with a mixture of interest and amusement. "'Your health,' he said in a rich, deep voice. I returned his greeting politely and then busied myself with the job of trying to get the second snake into the basket without letting the first one escape. You are a stranger? he asked. I said that I was English and that I and my family lived in a villa up in the hills. I'm going down to the sea, he said, down to my boat. Where are you going? I said I was making for the sea too, first to wash and secondly to find some cockles to eat. I will walk with you, he said, rising and stretching. I have a basket full of cockles in my boat. You may have some of those, if you like. As we walked, I asked if he was a fisherman, and if so, where he came from. I come from here, from the hills, he replied. At least my home is here, but I am now at Vido. The reply puzzled me, for Vido was a tiny islet lying off the town of Corfu, and as far as I knew, it had no one on it at all except convicts and warders, for it was the local prison island. I pointed this out to him. That's right, he agreed, stooping to pat Roger as he ambled past. <laughs> That's right. I'm a convict. I have another two years to do. But I am a good prisoner, you see, trustworthy and make no trouble. Any like me, those they feel they can trust, are allowed to make boats and sail home for the weekend if it is not too far. I have got to be back there first thing Monday morning. I was bursting with curiosity to know what his crime had been, and I was just phrasing a tactful inquiry in my mind when we reached the boat, and inside it was something that drove all other thoughts from my head. In the stern... Tethered to the seat by one yellow leg sat an immense black-backed gull who contemplated me with sneering yellow eyes. I stepped forward eagerly and I stretched out my hand to the broad, dark back. Be careful, watch out. He is a bully, that one, said the man urgently. His warning came too late, for I had already placed my hand on the bird's back and was gently running my fingers over the silken feathering. The gull crouched, opened his beak slightly, and with the dark iris of his eye contracted with surprise. But he was so taken aback by my audacity that he did nothing. Spiridion, said the man in amazement. He must like you. He's never let anyone else touch him without biting. We sat in the boat and ate shellfish, and all the time... I watched the bird. From the soles of his great webbed feet to the tip of his beak, he was, in my opinion, quite admirable. I swallowed a final cockle, wiped my hands on the side of the boat, and asked the man if he could get a baby gull for me the following spring. You want one? he asked in surprise. You like them? I felt this was understating my feelings. I would have sold my soul for such a gull. Well, have him if you want him, said the man casually, jerking a thumb at the bird. I could hardly believe my ears. For someone to possess such a wonderful creature 
and to offer him as a gift carelessly was incredible. He knows his name, the man remarked, clasping the gull's beak between his fingers and waggling it gently. I call him Aleko. He'll come when you call. Aleko, on hearing his name, paddled his feet wildly and looked up into my face with questioning yellow eyes. You'll be wanting some fish for him, remarked the man. I'm going out in the boat tomorrow about eight. If you like to come, we can catch a good lot for him. I said that would be fine, and Aleko gave a yarp of agreement. The man leant against the bows of the boat to push it out, and I suddenly remembered something. As casually as I could, I asked him what his name was and why he was in prison. He smiled charmingly over his shoulder. My name's Costi, he said. Costi Panopoulos. I killed my wife. Once home, I stamped into the drawing room and put a lecco on the floor. His noise brought Mother and Margot hurrying in from the kitchen. What on earth? that gasped Mother. Oh, what an enormous bird, exclaimed Margot. What is it, an eagle? My family's lack of ornithological knowledge had always been a source of annoyance to me. I explained testily that it was not an eagle but a black-backed gull and told them how I'd got him. But, dear, how on earth are we going to feed him, asked Mother. I mean, does he eat fish? Aleko, I said, hopefully, would eat anything. Then I tried to catch him, but he screamed and trumpeted loudly, and that brought Larry and Leslie down from their rooms. Who the hell's playing bagpipes? demanded Larry as he swept in. Aleko paused for a moment, surveyed this newcomer coldly, and having summed him up, yarped loudly and scornfully. My God, said Larry, backing hastily and bumping into Leslie. What the devil's that? It's a new bird Jerry's got, said Margot. Doesn't it look fierce? It's a gull, said Leslie, peering over Larry's shoulder. What a whacking great thing. Nonsense, said Larry. It's an albatross. No, it's a gull. Now, don't be silly. Whoever saw a gull that size, I tell you, it's a bloody great albatross. Aleko padded a few paces towards Larry and yarped at him again. Call him off, Larry commanded. Jerry, get that damn thing under control. It's attacking me. Where did you get him, anyway? Leslie asked. I explained about my meeting with Costi omitting any mention of the water snakes, for all snakes were taboo with Leslie, and how he'd given me the bird. Nobody in their right senses would give somebody a present like that, observed Larry. Who is this man, anyway? Without thinking, I said he was a convict. A convict, quavered Mother. What do you mean, a convict? I explained about Costi being allowed home for the weekends because he was a trusted member of the Vido community. I added that he and I were going fishing the next morning. Oh, I don't know whether it's very wise, dear, Mother said doubtfully. I don't like the idea of your going about with a convict. You never know what he's done. Indignantly, I said I knew perfectly well what he'd done. He'd killed his wife. A murderer, said Mother aghast. But what's he doing wandering round the countryside? Why didn't they hang him? After an hour's arguing and pleading... I finally got Mother to agree that I should go fishing with Costi, providing that Leslie came down and had a look at him first. So the next morning I went fishing with Costi, and when we returned with enough food to keep Aleko occupied for a couple of months, I asked my friend to come up to the villa so that Mother could inspect him for herself. Mother had, after considerable mental effort, managed to commit to memory two or three Greek words. So she had to sit on the veranda, smiling nervously, while Costi, in his faded shirt and tattered pants, drank a glass of beer, and while I translated his conversation. He seems such a nice man, Mother said, when Costi had taken his leave. He doesn't look a bit like a murderer. You simply can't judge by physical appearance, Larry pointed out. You can only tell by a person's actions. I could have told you he was a murderer at once. Oh, how, dear, said Mother, very intrigued. Oh, elementary, said Larry with a deprecating sigh. No one but a murderer would have thought of giving Jerry that albatross. With a gentlemanly honesty which I found hard to forgive, 
Mr. Krafelski had informed Mother that he'd taught me as much as he was able. The time had come, he thought, for me to go to somewhere like England or Switzerland to finish my education. In desperation, I argued against any such idea. I said I liked being half-educated. You were so much more surprised at everything when you were ignorant. But Mother was adamant. We were to return to England and spend a month or so there consolidating our position, which meant arguing with the bank, and then we would decide where I was to continue my studies. In order to quell the angry mutterings of rebellion in the family, she told us that we should look on it merely as a holiday, a pleasant trip. We should soon be back again in Corfu. Our mountain of possessions was arranged in the customs shed, and Mother stood by it, jangling an enormous bunch of keys. Outside, in the brilliant white sunlight, the rest of the family talked with Theodore and Krafelski, who had come to see us off. The customs officer made his appearance and wilted slightly at the sight of our mound of baggage, crowned with a cage from which the magpies peered malevolently. Mother smiled nervously and shook her keys, looking as guilty as a diamond smuggler. The customs man surveyed Mother and the luggage, tightened his belt and frowned. These your... He inquired, making quite sure. Uh, yes, yes, all mine, twittered Mother, playing a rapid solo on her keys. Did you, um, did you want me to open anything? The customs man considered, pursing his lips thoughtfully. Uh, mm. you new clues, he asked. Uh, what, I, I'm, I'm sorry, said Mother. Hoff you any new clues? Mother cast a desperate glance round for Spiro. I, I, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't quite catch. Have you any new clues? Any new clues? Mother smiled with desperate charm. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't quite... The customs man fixed her with an angry eye. Madame he said ominously, leaning over the counter. Do you speak English? Oh, yes, exclaimed Mother, delighted at having understood him. Yes, a little. She was saved from the wrath of the man by the timely arrival of Spiro. He lumbered in, sweating profusely, soothed Mother, calmed the customs man, explained that we had not had any new clothes for years, and had the luggage shifted outside onto the quay almost before anyone could draw breath. Then he borrowed the customs man's piece of chalk and marked all the baggage himself, so there would be no further confusion. Well, I won't say goodbye, but only au revoir, mumbled Theodore, shaking hands precisely with each one of us. I hope we shall have you back with us. Ah. <laughs> very, very soon. Spiro shook each of us silently by the hand and then stood staring at us, his face screwed up into the familiar scowl, twisting his cap in his huge hands. Well, I'll say goodbyes, he began, and his voice wavered and broke, great fat tears squeezing themselves from his eyes and running down his furrowed cheeks. Honest to gods, I didn't mean to cry. <laughs> he sobbed, his vast stomach heaving. But it's just like saying goodbyes to my own peoples. I feel you belongs to me. As the ship drew across the sea, and Corfu sank shimmering into the pearly heat haze on the horizon, a black depression settled on us, which lasted all the way back to England. The grimy train scuttled its way up from Brindisi towards Switzerland, and we sat in silence, not wishing to talk. Above our heads on the rack the magpies chucked and hammered with their beaks, and a lecco gave a mournful yarp at intervals. Around our feet the dogs lay snoring. 
At the Swiss frontier, our passports were examined by a disgracefully efficient official. He handed them back to Mother, together with a small slip of paper, bowed unsmilingly, and left us to our gloom. Some moments later, Mother glanced at the form the official had filled in, and as she read it, she stiffened. Just look what he's put, she exclaimed indignantly. Impertinent man. Larry stared at the little form and snorted. Well, that's the penalty you pay for leaving Corfu, he pointed out. On the little card, in the column headed Description of Passenger, had been written in neat capitals, One Travelling Circus and Staff. What a thing to write, said Mother, still simmering. Really, some people are peculiar. The train rattled towards England. Winter came to the island gently, as a rule. For a week or so, the wind played with the island, patting it, humming to itself among the bare branches. Then there was a lull, a few days' strange calm. Suddenly, when you least expected it, the wind would be back. But it was a changed wind, a mad, hooting, bellowing wind that leapt down on the island and tried to blow it into the sea. The blue sky vanished as a cloak of fine grey cloud was thrown over the island. The sea turned a deep blue, almost black, and became crusted with foam. This was the shooting season, and Leslie, of course, was in his element. With a band of fellow enthusiasts, he made trips over to the mainland once a fortnight, returning with the great bristly carcass of wild boar, cloaks of blood-stained hares, and huge baskets brimming over with the iridescent carcasses of ducks. Dirty, unshaven, smelling strongly of gun oil and blood, Leslie would give us the details of the hunt. He had, he explained to us, pulled off his first left and right. He had to explain in detail, however, before we grasped the full glory of his action. Apparently a left and a right, in hunting parlance, meant to shoot and kill two birds or animals in quick succession, first with your left barrel, and then with your right. Very good, dear, said Mother, when Leslie had described the scene for the fourth time. It must have been very difficult. Well, I don't see why, said Larry. Leslie, who was just about to describe the whole thing over again, broke off and glared at him. Oh, you don't, he asked belligerently. And what do you know about it? You couldn't hit an olive tree at three paces, let alone a flying bird. My dear fellow, I'm not belittling you, said Larry, in his most irritating and unctuous voice. I just don't see why it's considered so difficult to perform what seems to me a very simple task. Simple? If you'd had any experience of shooting, you wouldn't call it simple. I don't see that it's necessary to have had shooting experience. Seems to me to be merely a matter of keeping a cool head and aiming reasonably straight. Oh, don't be silly, said Les disgustedly. You always think the things other people do are simple. All right, let's just see you pull off a left and a right, then. Certainly. You supply the gun and the victims, and I'll show you that it requires no ability whatsoever. It's a question of a mercurial mind that can weigh up the mathematics of the problem. Right, we'll go after Snipe down in the marsh tomorrow. You can get your mercurial mind to work on those. Early next morning, when we set off to see Larry perform his feat, the ground was moist and squelchy underfoot and smelt as rich and fragrant as plum cake. The swamp was really the level floor of a small valley, some ten acres of flat land which were cultivated during the spring and summer months. In the winter it was allowed to run wild, and it became a forest of bamboos and grass, intersected by the brimming irrigation ditches, spanned here and there by narrow plank bridges, most of which were rickety and decayed, but which were the only means of getting about the swamp. Ahead, we could hear a pair of magpies cackling fiendishly whenever we moved. Larry muttered threats and curses on them for warning the game. He stopped at the head of a tiny bridge that sagged over a wide expanse of placid water. Can't we do something about those birds, he inquired heatedly. They'll scare everything for miles. Not the snipe, said Leslie. The snipe stick close until you almost walk on them. It seems quite futile to continue, said Larry. 
We might as well send a brass band ahead of us. He tucked the gun under his arm and stamped irritably onto the bridge. It was then the accident occurred. He was in the middle of the groaning, shuddering plank when two snipe, which had been lying concealed in the long grass at the other end of the bridge, rocketed out of the grass and shot skywards. Larry, forgetting in his excitement his rather peculiar situation, shipped the gun to his shoulder and, balancing precariously on the swaying bridge, fired both barrels. The gun roared and kicked, the snipe flew away undamaged, and Larry, with a yell of fright, fell backwards into the irrigation ditch. Hold the gun above your head! Hold it above your head! roared Leslie. Don't stand up or you'll sink! screeched Margot. Sit still! But Larry, spread eagled on his back, had only one idea, and that was to get out as quickly as possible. He sat up and then tried to get to his feet, using to Leslie's anguish the gun barrels as a support. He raised himself up, the liquid mud shuddered and boiled, the gun sank out of sight, and Larry disappeared up to his waist. Look what you've done to the gun, yelled Leslie furiously. You've choked the bloody barrels. Well, what the hell do you expect me to do, snarled Larry. Lie here and be sucked under. Give me a hand, for heaven's sake. Get the gun out, said Leslie angrily. Larry groped wildly under the surface for the gun and sank several inches before he retrieved it, clotted with black and evil-smelling mud. Dear God, just look at it, moaned Leslie, wiping the mud off it with his handkerchief. Just look at it. Will you stop carrying on over that beastly weapon and get me out of here, asked Larry vitriolically. Or do you want me to sink beneath the mud like a sort of sportsman's shelly? Leslie handed him the ends of the barrels, and we all heaved mightily. It seemed to make no impression whatsoever, except that when we stopped, exhausted, Larry sank a little deeper. The idea is to rescue me, he pointed out, panting, not to deliver the coup de grace. At last, after much effort, there came a prolonged belch from the mud, and Larry shot to the surface, and we hauled him up the bank. He stood there, covered with the black and stinking slush, looking like a chocolate statue that has come in contact with a blast furnace. He appeared to be melting as we approached. As he limped homewards, he poured scorn and wrath on our heads, and by the time we reached home, he was convinced that the whole thing had been a plot. He refused all offers of assistance, collected a bottle of brandy from the larder, and retired to his room, where, on his instruction, Lugaretzia built a huge fire. He sat muffled up in bed, sneezing and consuming brandy. By lunchtime, he sent down for another bottle, and at tea time, we could hear him singing lustily, interspersed with gigantic sneezes. At supper time, Lugaretzia had paddled upstairs with the third bottle, and Mother began to get worried. She sent Margot up to see if Larry was all right. There was a long silence, followed by Larry's voice raised in wrath and Margot's pleading plaintively. Mother, frowning, stumped upstairs to see what was happening, and Leslie and I followed her. The bedclothes heaved, and Larry's tousled head appeared from the depths. He peered blearily at Mother, and blinked thoughtfully to himself. You're a horrible old woman. I'm sure I've seen you somewhere before, he remarked. And before Mother had recovered, from the shock of this observation, he had sunk into a deep sleep. Well, said Mother aghast, he must have had a lot. Anyway, he's asleep now, so let's just build up the fire and leave him. He'll feel better in the morning. It was Margot who discovered early the following morning that a pile of glowing wood from the fire had slipped down between the boards of the room and set fire to the beam underneath. She came flying downstairs in her nighty, pale with emotion, and burst into Mother's room. The house is on fire. Get out, get out, she yelled dramatically. Mother leapt out of bed with alacrity. Wake up, Jerry, wake up, Jerry, she shouted, struggling for some reason best known to herself to get her corsets on over her nighty. Wake up, wake up, fire, fire, screamed Margot at the top of her voice. Leslie and I tumbled out onto the landing. What's going on, demanded Leslie. Fire, screamed Margot in his ear. Larry's on fire. Mother, a 
appeared looking decidedly eccentric with her corsets done up crookedly over her nighty. Larry's on fire! Quick, save him! she screamed and rushed upstairs to the attic, closely followed by the rest of us. Larry's room was full of acrid smoke, which poured up from beneath the floorboards. Larry himself lay sleeping peacefully. Mother dashed over to the bed and shook him vigorously. Wake up, Larry! Oh, for heaven's sake, wake up! What, what, uh, what's the matter? he asked, sitting up sleepily. Well, the room is on fire. Mm, I'm not surprised, he said, lying down again. Ask Les to put it out, will you? Les, muttering wrathfully, hauled the bedclothes off the recumbent Larry and used them to smother the flames. Larry sat up indignantly. What the hell's going on, he demanded. The room's on fire, dear. Well, I don't see why I should freeze to death. Why tear all the bedclothes off? Really, the fuss you all make, it is quite simple to put out a fire. Oh, shut up, snapped Leslie, jumping up and down on the bedclothes. I've never known people for panicking like you all do, said Larry. It's simply a matter of keeping your head. Les has the worst of it under control. Now, if Jerry fetches the hatchet and you, Mother and Margot, fetch some water, we'll soon have it out. Eventually, while Larry lay in bed and directed operations, the rest of us managed to rip up the planks and put out the smouldering beam. There you are, Larry pointed out, all done without fuss and panic. It's just a matter of keeping your head. I would like somebody to bring me a cup of tea, please. I've got the most splitting headache. I'm not surprised you were tiddled as an owl last night, said Les. If you can't tell the difference between a high fever due to exposure and a drunken orgy, it's hardly fair to besmirch my character, Larry pointed out. Well, the fever's left you with a good hangover anyway, said Margot. It is not a hangover, said Larry with dignity. It's just the strain of being woken up at the crack of dawn by a hysterical pack of people and having to take control in a crisis. Fat lot of controlling you did lying in bed, snorted Leslie. It's not the action that counts, it's the brain work behind it. The quickness of wit, the ability to keep your head when all about you are losing theirs. If it hadn't been for me, you'd have probably all been burnt in your beds. Spring had arrived and the island was sparkling with flowers. In the crisp, heady weather, the family spent most of its time on the veranda, eating, sleeping, reading, or just simply arguing. It was here, once a week, that we used to congregate to read our mail, which Spiro had brought out to us. Mother always left to the last a fat letter, addressed in large, firm, well-rounded handwriting, which was the monthly instalment from great Aunt Hermione. Her letter invariably created an indignant uproar among the family, so we all put aside our mail and concentrated when Mother, with a sigh of resignation, unfurled the twenty-odd pages, settled herself comfortably, and began to read. She says the doctors don't hold out much hope for her, observed Mother. They haven't held out any hope for her for the last forty years, and she's still as strong as an ox, said Larry. Oh, heavens! Oh, no! Oh, Lord! What's the matter? She says she wants to come and stay. The doctors have advised a warm climate. No, I refuse. I couldn't bear it, shouted Larry, leaping to his feet. It's bad enough being shown Lugaretzia's gums every morning without having great Aunt Hermione dying by inches all over the place. You'll have to put her off, Mother. Tell her there's no room. Oh, but I can't, dear. I told her in the last letter what a big villa we had. Well, she's probably forgotten, said Leslie, hopefully. Oh, she hasn't. She mentions it here. Now, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, ah, yeah, here you are. As you now seem able to afford such an extensive establishment, I am sure, Louis, dear, that you would not begrudge a small corner to an old woman who has not much longer to live. There you are. Oh, dear, what on earth can we do? Well, there's only one thing to do, said Larry, resignedly. What's that? inquired Mother, peering over her spectacles expectantly. Well, we must move, of course. Move? Move where? asked Mother, bewildered. Well, move to a smaller villa. Then you can write to her and say we haven't any room. There was a pause while Mother polished her spectacles feverishly. Oh, but it seems so, well, so eccentric to keep changing villas like that, dear, she said at last. There is nothing eccentric about it, said Larry, surprised. It is a perfectly logical thing to do. Of course it is, agreed Leslie. It's a sort of self-defence, anyway. Oh, do be sensible, Mother, said Margot. After all, a change is as good as a feast. So bearing that novel proverb in mind, 
we moved. Perched on a hilltop among olive trees, the new villa, white as snow, had a broad veranda running along one side which was hung with a thick pelmet of grapevine. In front of the house was a pocket handkerchief sized garden, neatly walled, which was a solid tangle of wild flowers. The whole garden was overshadowed by a large magnolia tree, the glossy dark green leaves of which cast a deep shadow. The rutted driveway wound away from the house, down the hillside, through olive groves, vineyards and orchards, before reaching the road. We had liked the villa the moment Spiro had shown it to us. It stood decrepit, but immensely elegant, among the drunken olives. Half a mile or so from the villa rose a fairly large conical hill, covered with grass and heather, and crowned with three tiny olive groves, separated from each other by wide beds of myrtle. I called these three little groves the Cyclamen Woods, for in the right season the ground beneath the olive trees was flushed magenta and wine red with the flowers of Cyclamen, that seemed to grow more thickly and more luxuriantly here than anywhere else in the countryside. It was an ideal spot in which to rest after a hectic lizard hunt, when your head was pounding with the heat, your clothes limp and discoloured with perspiration, and the three dogs hung out their pink tongues and panted like ancient miniature railway engines. It was while the dogs and I were resting after just such a hunt that I acquired two new pets and indirectly started off a chain of coincidences that affected both Larry and Mr. Krafelski, my new tutor, a man descended from an intricate tangle of nationalities, but predominantly English. I was leaning against an olive trunk that had spent the past hundred years growing itself into the right shape for a perfect backrest. Far below, over a blonde square of ripening maize, a small black and white shape appeared, like a piebald Maltese cross, heading determinedly for the hilltop on which I sat. As it flew up towards me, the magpie uttered three brief, harsh chucks that sounded rather muffled as though its beak were full of food. It dived as neatly as an arrow into the depths of an olive tree some distance away. There was a pause, and then there arose a chorus of shrill, wheezing shrieks from among the leaves which swept to a crescendo and died slowly away. Again I heard the magpie chuck softly and warningly, and it leapt out of the leaves and glided off down the hillside once more. High up among the branches, half hidden by the green and silver leaves, I could make out a large, oval bundle of twigs, like a huge furry football, wedged among the branches. Excitedly, I, I started to scramble up the tree, while the dogs gathered at the bottom of the trunk and watched me with interest. When I was near to the nest, I, I looked down, and my stomach writhed, for the dogs' faces, peering up at me eagerly, were the size of pimpernel flowers. Carefully, my, my palms sweating, I edged my way out along the branches until I crouched side by side with the nest among the breeze-ruffled leaves. It was a massive structure, a great basket of carefully interwoven sticks, a deep cup of mud and rootlets in its heart. The entrance hole through the wall was small, and the twigs that surrounded it bristled with sharp thorns, as did the sides of the nest and the neatly domed wickerwork roof. It was the sort of nest designed to discourage the most ardent ornithologist. Trying to avoid looking down, I lay on my stomach along the branch and pushed my hand carefully inside the thorny bundle groping in the mud cup. Under my fingers, I could feel soft, quivering skin and fluff, while a shrill chorus of wheezes rose from inside the nest. Carefully, I curved my fingers round one fat, warm baby and drew it out. Enthusiastic though I was, even I had to admit it was no beauty. Its squat beak, with a yellow fold at each corner, the bald head, and the half-open and bleary eyes gave it a drunken and rather imbecile look. The skin hung in folds and wrinkles all over its body. 
groping about inside the nest, I found that there were three other youngsters, each as revolting as the one I had in my hand. After some thought, and having examined each of them with care, I decided to take two and leave the other pair for the mother. This struck me as being quite fair, and I didn't see how the mother could possibly object. I chose the largest, because he'd grow up quickly, and the smallest, because he looked so pathetic. Put them carefully inside my shirt, and climbed cautiously back to the waiting dogs. As I carried my new pets homewards, I tried to decide what to call them. I was still debating this problem when I reached the villa and found the family who had just been on a shopping expedition into town disgorging from the car. Holding out the babies in my cupped hands, I inquired if anyone could think of a suitable pair of names for them. The family took one look and all reacted in their individual ways. Aren't they sweet, said Margot. "'What are you going to feed them on?' asked Mother. "'What revolting things!' said Leslie. "'Not more animals,' asked Larry with distaste. "'What you's going to do with them bastards?' asked Spiro. "'Somewhat acidly, I said that I intended to keep them as pets, "'and that furthermore they were not bastards, but magpies.' "'What you call them?' asked Spiro, scowling. "'Magpies, Spiro.' Magpies, said Mother, enunciating slowly and clearly. Spiro turned this new addition to his English vocabulary over in his mind, repeating it to himself, getting it firmly embedded. Magan pies, he said at last. Mm, Magan pies, eh? Magpies, Spiro corrected Margot. That's what I says, said Spiro indignantly. Magan pies. So from that moment, we gave up trying to find a name for them, and they became known simply as the Magenpies. By the time the Magenpies had gorged themselves to a size where they were fully fledged, Larry had become so used to seeing them around that he'd forgotten their allegedly criminal habits. Fat, glossy and garrulous, the Magenpies looked the very picture of innocence. All went well until they learned to fly. The place that intrigued and fascinated them most was Larry's bedroom, and I think this was because they never managed to get a good look inside. Before they'd even touched down on the windowsill, they would be greeted with such roars of rage, followed by a rapidly discharged shower of missiles, that they would be forced to flap rapidly away to the safety of the magnolia tree. They couldn't understand Larry's attitude at all. They decided that since he'd made such a fuss, it must be that he had something to hide and that it was their duty to find out what it was. They chose their time carefully, waiting patiently, until one afternoon Larry went off for a swim and left his window open. I didn't discover what the magpies had been up to until Larry came back. As he came up the hill, he saw to his horror one of them sitting on the sill and shouted wrathfully at it. The bird gave a chuck of alarm, and the other one flew out of the room and joined it. They flapped off into the magnolia tree, chuckling hoarsely, like schoolboys caught raiding an orchard. Larry burst into the house and swept up to his room, grabbing me en route. When he opened the door, Larry uttered a moan like a soul in torment. The magpies had been through the room as thoroughly as any Secret Service agent searching for missing plans. Piles of manuscript and typing paper lay scattered about the floor like drifts of autumn leaves, most of them with an attractive pattern of holes punched in them, the magpies never could resist paper. The typewriter stood stolidly on the table, looking like a disemboweled horse in a bullring. Its ribbon was coiling out of its interior, its keys bespattered with droppings. The carpet, the bed and the table were a glitter with a layer of paper clips like frost. The magpies, obviously suspecting Larry of being a dope smuggler, had fought valiantly with a tin of bicarbonate of soda, and had scattered its contents along a line of books, so that they looked like a snow-covered mountain range. The table, the floor, the manuscript, the bed, and especially the pillow, were decorated with an artistic and unusual chain of footprints in green and red ink. 
This is the last straw, said Larry in a shaking voice. Positively the last straw. Either you do something about those birds, or I will personally wring their necks. The rest of the family, finding they could not siesta with the argument going on, assembled to find out the trouble. Oh, good heavens, dear, what have you been doing? asked Mother, peering round the wrecked room. Mother, I am in no mood to answer imbecile questions. It must be the magpies, said Leslie, with the relish of a prophet proved right. Anything missing? No, nothing missing, said Larry bitterly. They spared me that. They made an awful mess of your papers, observed Margot. Larry stared at her for a moment, breathing deeply. What a masterly understatement, he said at last. You are always ready with the apt platitude to sum up a catastrophe. There's no need to be rude, said Margot. Larry didn't mean it, dear, explained Mother untruthfully. He's just naturally upset. Upset? Upset? Those scab-ridden vultures come flapping in here like a pair of critics and tear and bespatter my manuscript before it's even finished, and you say I'm upset? Larry looked so murderous that I decided it would probably be safer if the magpies were removed from danger. So I lured them into my bedroom with the aid of a raw egg and locked them up in their basket while I considered the best thing to do. It was obvious that they would have to go into a cage of sorts, but I wanted a really large one for them, and I didn't feel that I could cope with the building of a really big aviary by myself. It was useless asking the family to help me, so I decided that I would have to inveigle Mr. Krafelski into the constructional work. He could come out and spend the day, and once the cage was finished, he would have the opportunity of teaching me how to wrestle. I had waited a long time for a favourable opportunity of getting these wrestling lessons, and this seemed to me to be 